at Agape, I just feel it's not, you know, just a church where you walk in and you leave and no one notices. Um, I really feel like the people here are family and um, it's something that we're always hanging out together, we're always doing life together. So Agape is really a family-oriented church, you know. It's not a service that you just come to and, you know, get your word and then leave. So you come, you know, you meet people, you greet them, you all like get along well and you, you get in the Word of God together and then you go out and fellowship together. From the time we stepped in to the time we left, we were just overwhelmed with people. Just people fellowship, people welcoming us, people making us feel very comfortable, very much at home, very much like we were one. My favorite part about being in Agape is that um, I've never really heard the gospel the way that I've heard it here. And so it's different and it's just it's just so wonderful and it really it just really fills my soul. So I, I like this and I've not seen it anywhere else. My favorite thing about Agape is being able to serve and and help with the community and help with the church. Um, and I think just being able to, to serve and be in that spirit of service is, is the best part of being a part of the church. I think Agape is the greatest sense of family that you can get and uh, just a great sense of community that holds you accountable and really helps you grow in your faith and and also it's just a great group to be around and they're constantly just uh, supporting you. So at worship I play the drums and uh, so that I really enjoy that and I also uh, love being part of the band and it's a great great time. So what I love about this church is the community and that we're all so close and always there for one another. Um, whenever someone's going through a rough time, you have like everyone there as a big community of sisters and brothers. I think that people should come and visit Agape because we have such an incredible, incredible and diverse group of people here. We have people from all over the world, all over the country, all over Texas, from different walks of life, different ages, and we all come together for one purpose and that's to serve God and love each other. So I think it's a place that anyone can call home. Loving fellowship. Community. Family. Worship. Church. Love. Agape. Love. Agape. 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 Good morning, everybody. Happy Sunday to all of you. You can stand up with me as we sing this morning. It's a good day today, beautiful weather. Let's praise together the Lord. Here we go. You call us out from the dead into your freedom. Our chains are gone. No weapon formed shall prevail. Your word is stronger, we overcome. Amen. Do we believe that his word is stronger than anything in this world? Here we go. Your glory. Your glory resounds through the age. All saints declaring your great reign now. Your kingdom forever will stand. We won't be shaken, we will not fear. Our God, a mighty warrior. Our God, a mighty warrior. You're a consuming fire. In victory you reign. We triumph in your name. Jesus, the great commander. You 
conquer death forever In victory you reign We triumph in your name Sing one more time, your glory resounds Your glory resounds through the age All saints declaring your great renown your kingdom forever will stand we won't be shaken we will not fear not god a mighty warrior you're a consuming fire in victory you reign we triumph in your name jesus the great commander you conquered death forever in victory Triumph in your name. We declare your name is power. Exalted one, no name is higher. You stand alone, a strong defender. And above you, there's no other. Above you, there's no other. no other above you there's no other above you there's no other above you there's no other now god a mighty warrior you're a consuming fire in victory you reign we triumph in your name jesus the great commander you conquer death forever in victory you reign we triumph You're a consuming fire in victory you reign. We triumph in your name, Jesus the great commander. In victory you reign. We triumph in your name. We sing. God is able, He will never fail, He is Almighty God. He's greater than everything, greater than all we see, greater than all we ask. He has done great things, lifted up, defeated the grave, raised to life. Our God is able, in His name we overcome, for the Lord our God is able. Sing, God is with us. God is with us. God is on our side, He will make a way, far above all we know, far above all we hope, He has done great things, lifted up, defeated the grave, raised to life.
lifted up, defeated the grave, raised to life, our God is stable, in His name we overcome. may fail my God you never will I may be weak your spirit strong in me my flesh may fail my God you never will I may be weak your spirit strong in me my flesh may fail my God you never will strong in me my flesh may fail my God you never will give me faith to trust what you say that your good your love is great broken inside I give you my love you are God that never fails. You are strong. No, 
our strength is in you, Lord. We rely on you for everything in our lives, Lord. We thank you for bringing us to this place to worship you and hear you, Lord. We are eager to hear your voice this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. God is good, amen? I have a question for you get, before I get started. Um, how many of you hope to make a difference in the world? So let me ask you, what, and I, I'd like a little feedback. What does it take to make a difference? Don't be super spiritual on me. Just <laughs> being different? Okay. Well, let's say make a good difference in the world. <laughs> what, so what, what do you think it takes? I mean, you're... You know, a lot of you, you're still young. You're thinking, you know, future, career, how's not just be successful. How will this success help others? So what's it going to take? Say it again. Hard work. That's good. What else? Oh, it's impossible not to. Just say that again. Y yes. And how do you make a good difference? Because we know people that make a difference, it's not a good difference, right? N no, no one here, of course. So it's interesting. I had this message, but it's, it's, the Lord reminded me of something. I thought, oh, let me f see if I can find it. And uh, thank God for smartphones, right? They're smarter than me. <laughs> but I, I remember uh, years ago, many, many years ago, seeing this one Christmas card. I thought, wow, that really... And I may have seen it prior to becoming a believer in Christ, even as a Muslim. And I probably just tossed it aside. But I thought of it again this morning. And it, it and the title of it is, and you probably have read it, is it, called One Solitary Life. Anybody ever hear that poem? And it goes something like this. You tell me who he's talking about. He was born in an obscure village. The child of a peasant woman. He grew up in another obscure village where he worked in a carpenter shop. So who am I talking about? Jesus, right? But, but listen to this. Until he was 30, he grew up in a carpenter shop until he was 30 when public opinion turned against him. He never wrote a book. He never held an office. He never went to college. He never visited a big city. He never traveled more than 200 miles from the place where he was born. He did none of these things. And I can say he had no smartphone. He had no technology, no social media. He did none of these things usually associated with greatness. He had no credentials but himself. He was only 33. His friends ran away. One of them denied him. Another betrayed him. He was turned over to his enemies. He went through the mockery of a trial. He was nailed to a cross between two thieves. While dying, his executioners gambled for his clothing, the only property he had on earth. When he was dead, he was laid in a borrowed grave though the pit, through the pity of a friend. And Think about this. It doesn't sound like greatness, does it? doesn't sound like how you make a difference but then 19 centuries have come and gone and today Jesus is the central figure of the human race and the leader of mankind's progress all the armies that have ever marched all the navies that have ever sailed all the parliaments that have ever sat all the kings that have ever reigned put together have not affected the life of mankind on earth as powerfully as that one solitary life. And just think about it. In the natural, if we were to look, we'd say, oh, this guy's really not making a, a difference. But he's made the biggest difference in human mankind. And I, so I thought, what does it take for us to make a difference? And I'm going to share something I've shared before because I think oftentimes I heard something this morning. It must have been on Christian television and there was a lady speaking about being free to set others free. But uh, apparently there was a struggle. A lot of people don't think that their lives count. And 
there was, there's a gentleman named Andy Andrews. He's written several books, and I, I just have one of his real small, one, small ones called The Butterfly Effect. Excuse me. But uh, it's interesting why he wrote this. Hello? It's, praise God, God is good. Amen. So, so, so watch this. What happened is uh, the U.S. service military men and women, uh, this was several years ago, and it's, it's, uh, it's, I'll say it like this. There have been an un unusual amount, numbers of, watch this, attempts and even successes at suicide in our military personnel. And it became an issue, and so the military themselves brought some people in, and they they, 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 I don't know how they did all these surveys and tests, and, and they came down to one root issue why uh, not only attempting but some succeeding, because they talked to the ones that are attempted and still survive, that the, the root core of it was they felt like, watch this, like their life really didn't matter. In the midst of war and death and friends and, family, and just, they thought, like, I, I really don't count. So what they did, they started telling them that they really matter and that their lives really count. Well, as the months went by, the percentage of numbers did not seem to change. So the military actually contacted this gentleman, Andy Andrews. That's how he came up with this book. And they told him the situation, and this is, was the assignment that they gave him. We want you to prove to them that their lives really matter and make a difference. Well, how do you do that? How do you really... Tell someone that their life matters, their life counts. So what he did, and, and I, I, I kind of like what he does. He, he takes well-known events in history, but he always goes down a little deeper to find out the core underneath and verify the stories. Uh, for one, he wrote another book. It's just interesting, and I forget the exact title, but it's something like How Do You Kill 10 Million People or something like that or six million people. And it has to do not just with the Holocaust, but it was interesting as he would watch, he would watch these documentaries, especially when the Jews were taken by Germans, put on these trains, and, and he'd watch these documentaries and he'd see a few Germans, a handful, with just a, a few guns, and they were directing tens of thousands of people to their death. And he thought, how does that happen? You know, if they just turn against it, they overtake, the mob overtakes them. And come to find out, the, the gist of it, he, he says, watch this. If you lie loud enough, long enough, people start to believe. Because what they were telling, here's what they were doing. Okay, stay with your families. Stay with your, your sons and daughters. Stay with your wives. Because, because we have... So we have a good place for you to go. We have jobs. So they were lying, but they did it so loud and so long enough, people just started to believe, and they were taken straight to death. So, and so he, he, what he does, he does some research to see. So he did the same thing, and, and he founded two events in history, and I'm just going to choose one because this little book, The Butterfly Effect, you can actually read the whole book in like 10, 12 minutes. And it's two stories. And the first story is about a man named Norman Borlaug. I've mentioned him before, but in 2005, I think it was, he, he was not, not only won the Nobel Peace Prize, but he was the person of the week in the United States of America. And he was 90-something years old at that time. Pretty amazing. But nobody knew who Norman Borlaug was. Well, what, why is this good? Well, what he had done, watch this, he had hybridized wheat and corn produced his, he produced seed that actually would survive actually thrive in arid conditions so whether it was in the desert or siberia watch this he produced the seed that could, could that would produce and at that point when they made this announcement on television it was abc news watch this they said that he was directly responsible for the saving of lives from starvation do you know how many people over 2 billion people respond. They're still living because of this one single man. And I thought, 
okay, this guy had made, has made a big difference. And not only that, it continues to count. But as, he, as Andy did a little homework, he wanted to know more about this Norman Borla. Like how did he come up with this idea? Well, what's interesting, it wasn't his idea. Prior to, watch this, prior to Norman Borlaug, there was a man named Henry Wallace. He was, he was Secretary of Agriculture, but he actually served as Vice President during one of the terms of FDR. And while he was Vice President, he had an idea that he wanted to implement that he thought of earlier. He said, you know what? I want to open a mission in Mexico for one purpose. I want to hybridize seed, particularly wheat and corn, so... People can be saved from starvation. It was his idea. So he goes in his position. He opens his mission. And he hired this young man named Norman. And Norman did what, he told, what Henry told him to do. And Norman gets all the credit. But it was Henry's idea. So look at how his life made a difference in someone else's life. Because watch where I'm going with this. I'm going to tell you this. Your life really matters. Your life counts. And you may not see it right now. Because what's interesting, Henry Wallace, his idea... When he was just six years old, his dad was a dairy science professor at Iowa State. And watch this. He would actually bring his, his kid to school sometimes and to the university. But this, his, his dad had a young student, a 19-year-old student, that just really excelled. And watch this. He, he connected with his six-year-old son, Henry. So this that professor allowed this 19-year-old kid to take his six-year-old Henry on these, these weekend botanical expeditions. And, and the 19-year-old kid instilled in Henry that plant life can be used to help mankind. So he put it in him. So Andy says, well, actually, the 19-year-old the kid should get the credit. But do you know who that 19-year-old kid was? George Washington Carver. Anybody ever hear of him? So, so watch has anybody ever heard of George Washington Carver? Not we better do history right here. So watch this. So so watch this. But what's interesting, prior to that, in Diamond, Missouri, watch this. This was right right after the Civil War. Watch what happens. This is pretty amazing to me. There was a farmer named Moses, and because of his belief against slavery, it made his farm a target for the Quantrell Raiders. They are the ones that they would ride across the. The, 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 the states, really, and they were invading, especially the, those cause that were against sl slavery, and they were going in and they were burning, shooting, and killing every farm and ranch they could get their hands on and stealing. And one night, they hit Moses' farm, burning, shooting, and killing, killing. And as, watch this, as they were leaving, they grabbed a young black woman but she was holding on to her baby infant boy, and she would not let him go. And they rode off with her. Her name was Mary Washington. And when, when Moses' wife, Susan, heard what happened, she was so distraught. Uh, for one, uh, not just what happened, but, but, but Mary Washington was her best friend. So, what could she, what, so she watch what she did. She, she sent messengers and messages along their trail of devastation. And she's worked it out to connect with the Quantrell Raiders. And she worked it out where her husband would actually meet up with the Quantrell Raiders. And it was like, a, it, was, it was January, it was cold. It was like the Kansas-Missouri border, the river. And her husband was supposed to meet up with them. He didn't know what's going to happen, but she was determined to get Mary back. And uh, th the only thing left they had was one little black horse. And he rode off. On, his, on the little black horse, and it was cold. And that, that late one night, he, he gets to the river where they're supposed to meet. And sure enough, who is there? There were four Quantrell Raiders on horseback, and they all had sacks over their heads. And they had a burlap, this little burlap bag. And they commanded him. They, he, he had to get off his horse and let the horse go to them. And when they when he let the horse go, they threw him this burlap bag. And as he kind of catches and fumbles with it, and he opens it up to his shock, almost dead, naked baby boy, the infant, George. George Washington. Mary Washington. Well, Mary was gone. He took that baby, 
stuck it under his shirt, and he just tried to keep that baby warm because he has to walk quite a ways through the night until the next morning. And he got little George Washington to his home where Susan and Moses Carver took care of that boy, gave him their last name, and and I, and I just think about this. Help, help me. Just, let's just be real with this. Do you think that Susan, when she sent her husband Moses to go get Mary, who was now dead, that she was going to end up with a little boy, George, that not only she would give their last, their, their last name to him, but this young man would change the world? Do you think she was thinking that? Watch this. Because I, I think oftentimes we don't even realize at that moment as we take a a, a little risk or a little bravery or, or a little sacrifice or walk in love or, or give someone, we have no idea what it's doing, what it will produce later. We, we don't know at, the, at that moment. I, I don't think anyone ever really does. So so because you're right, our lives do make a difference. And I and I started to think about this and how one life impacted another, another, another. And then boom, two billion over two billion. Now, billions have been saved from starvation. And I and I just started and and I have 64 of them. I won't read them all. But what is this? So I, I started thinking of people in the Bible. I wonder if Moses' mom, when she hid him for three months and then had to put him out in the Nile, knowing he was special, I, I, I don't know that she was really thinking he would eventually deliver the people of Israel out, out of over 400 years of bondage and slavery. I don't think she was thinking that. I, I wonder even when, as David slung that sling, I don't think it was going to, he was thinking, oh, this will sling me into the kingdom and, and be the king of Israel. So, yeah, so there's little things that we say and do. And, and, I, and I think about, was it Naomi, as she loses her husband and her sons and, and her one daughter-in-law, Ruth, and, and they, head, they head back to Bethlehem, and, 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 and Ruth doesn't even belong there. But to, to, not only for her, but for Naomi to live, she goes out to the fields just to glean some wheat. She sat just, just, just so her mother-in-law can live. And I don't think she was thinking that as she was gleaning the wheat that she would meet a man named Boaz that not only possessed the land but would end up marrying her and not just take her out of poverty but ends up having sons that have another son that produces Jesse, son of David, and that her name, I don't think she was thinking, I'm doing this so my name will be written in the genealogy of Jesus. See, I don't think she was thinking that. And I think that all through the word of God, these people that just did what they know to do, just helping somebody out, help being a blessing, encouraging someone, how it would radically change their, not just their life, but literally many lives for eternity in the kingdom of God. So I, I jotted a few more. I, I wonder about Rahab, who had a life of shame, really a, a, a life a woman that just lived in, in as a prostitute and and a moment's decision she decides to protect these two men israeli god's men J jewish men just to protect them uh, in her house for just a little bit and i don't think she was thinking at the risk of her own life i don't oh yeah maybe she was thinking oh hopefully i can get favor and maybe spare my life because i know they're going to defeat this the town of jericho uh, but not only did it spare her life, but it saved her family's life. And she, too, marries into God's covenant people. And you can read in the Gospels and the genealogy. And Rahab's name is in there. See, I don't think she was planning that. I, I'm sure she wasn't planning that. She was just hoping to live. So, uh, so, so, so just think of some of these people. Uh, well, there's so many here. I'm trying to think, Lord, which ones you want me to bring out. How about Queen Esther? Why am I picking all these women? That's pretty amazing. So here's, here's Queen Esther. She's, you know, prior to that, uh, really as an orphan, and we say Uncle Mordecai it really wasn't an uncle, it was a cousin, is, is, is raising her up. And then, and then it, a, as the king wants an, a new bride, a new queen, she's taken into the harem and tested and, and everything and, and j just hiding her name for a while that she's a Jew. And then later on, I, I, I wonder if she was thinking that God would use her to save all of God's people. I don't think she was thinking that, but God uses her. And there's men and women, you know, there's, there's a couple that I really like. I mean, think about this. 
Here is a man who's totally demon possessed in the New Testament. He he's so out of control. What do they do to control him? Well, one they they chain him, and and then they put him over an I like across the water, and he's he lives among the tombs in in a graveyard. But he's so hopeless. He he breaks the chains. He cuts himself. He's a hopeless man. That everyone's fearful of him. That's why he's isolated like that. And so, so watch this. I, I always, always wondered as I read this story, how did this man in such darkness, devastation, loneliness, and hopelessness, how did he never take his life? I'm not sure, but by the grace of God. So I do want to say something. Your life makes so much difference. Don't you dare ever give up. Don't you ever dare quit. Don't you ever dare give the, the devil a party by removing yourself. And I don't you, and you may he, I'm sure he battled through depression, loneliness and everything else that many even here have battled with and, and maybe are. So but because of that in one moment's time in a day, not only does Jesus purposely come to see him, but he sets him free, which is you think is the greatest experience, but what's really interesting, after he was set free in a moment he said, Jesus, I'm going to follow you. And Jesus said, no, I want you to go home and tell them what great things God has done for you. And he was sent to the De- Decapolis, a ten towns that history records that revival has taken place because of this one man. I don't think he was thinking that when he was gripped by such demonic possession. And then you have another a woman uh, along the same lines, uh, except uh, she, she really didn't belong for for one, she'd been, she got married and it didn't work, and got married again and and again and again and again, and she was married five times and finally gave up. And now she's shacking up with the guy. She she goes out to the well to get water. She goes at noon because she don't want to be mocked or made fun or offended because by then everybody's gone because no one goes in the heat of the day to get water. And while she's there, she meets Jesus. She's kind of blown away by it, and through their dissertation, as you go through there she he eventually reveals to her that he's the messiah really the first person he ever reveals himself to and this woman who had this life of shame leaves the well goes to town and tells the whole town about this man that said everything that told me everything about myself and she's thinking is he is he must be the messiah well her testimony is so convincing that the whole it says they believed on Jesus because of her testimony. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? So let me tell you, wherever you are in life, whatever your walk is, whatever your struggle, your issue, your bondage, if you still have breath, God is not done with you. And he's chosen you to make a difference. And you can read even wicked people. It's amazing how God takes, their, takes and turns their lives, not just for good, but for his glory. So don't listen to the lies. You don't matter. You've already blown it. You're not worthy. Your life doesn't count. They're all lies from hell. Because God, it says in, in Psalm 139, before you ever begin to breathe, God scheduled every day of your life. So nothing about your life surprises God. He knows your bondage and your junk, and he still has a divine purpose and destiny for your life. We have an awesome God. Amen? You know, even as I go through the word, maybe my favorite, there's there's a, there's a, gen- a, a gentleman, there's a man who's the number one terrorist in the early church. Saul of Tarsus, you've heard of him, right? He's terrorizing Christians. He's having them arrested. He's for their death and their murder. And he encounters Jesus on the road to Damascus, radically transform his life. Now this terrorist becomes an apostle for Christ. Pretty bold and same passion and so much so, now he's thrown in prison. While he's in prison, he starts to write some notes and letters of encouragement for the churches where he started and where he'd been. I wonder if he was thinking, as he writes this letter to this church, that I pray that you would be rooted and grounded in love, that you would know the depth, the height, and the width. I wonder if he was thinking... I'm going to write this letter to encourage them because I know one day that this letter will become the canonized word of God. 
I really don't think he was thinking that. But think about this former terrorist as he writes these letters of encouragement and they guide our lives today and literally billions across the globe. And the word says, <laughs> it's, it's interesting, there's only two things that are never going to pass away. It's souls and the word of God. Written by a former terrorist. See, your life really matters. I, I don't, I, I, uh, being raised Muslim in, in my high school days, living in South Florida. And actually, I, I led two guys to Islam my first year of college at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in Daytona Beach, Florida. The same university where uh, that those responsible for 9-11, most of them got their pilot's training. That's where I got my pilot's license. And I led one of the guys, two of the guys to Islam, though that's where all the transmitter training in airline pilots. So most of the, the that group was already Muslim. But here's a couple of Americans ended up leading to leading to Islam and thinking that may be my call in life and that summer going back home and and I'm on the beach and a high school girl walks up to me and she's the first Christian to share the Christian faith with me and I really wasn't interested but she invited me and that's how I started invitation she invited me to this coffee house as a Christian I didn't want to go to anything Christian but she was cute so I went okay you know not as cute as my bride in case she gets to hear this so so, 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 so watch this. And yet, I know she was hoping that I would come to Christ. But I don't think she had any idea how God would use my life. And, and so much, and I, and I thought about this earlier. And you know that scarf illustration I do with the gospel? I won't do it, so maybe I'll have you, no, not now. But, but, but I was wondering, I remember I was in Africa ministering to Muslims in Kenya and, you know, I wrestled that night, the first night, because it was tough. And the next morning I got up and, and I, as I started to share the gospel, because they're waiting to get medical help. And I thought about the lady that had all these shawls and these scarves that she was selling. And as God gave me the thought to borrow one, and God uses that scarf illustration, literally, uh, let me say it this way. This, this month, I've seen at least... 400 people accept Christ through that scarf illustration. But I don't think that lady had any idea that her bringing those scarves that day would lead to the salvation of literally thousands. We, we have an awesome God. And, it, and as I recall, it just happened to be, I was, my d- dad's st- still living in Birnabella, the north side of Jerusalem. And, and as I went to visit one year, and, and I'm, I end up, going to the, some, some of the old shops in the old city and a young couple that I had met before and ended up sharing with them and literally opportunity in my dad's apartment leading them to Christ. Baptized them in the Sea of Galilee and then I went back home. I, I, and it was another nine and a half years before I ever went back. And I go back to find this gentleman. He's now the leader of the underground church of Muslims coming to Christ in Israel, the first underground church. My dad's apartment became the first underground church in all of Israel for Muslims coming to Christ. This young man now leads groups across the nations. And all I did was witness to a silversmith shop owner. We have no idea. And then my mom and dad prior to that, you know, it's interesting. uh, As I accepted Christ and told my parents and I had to leave home, I was disowned. And then God gave me a promise my, my house would be saved. And. Over the next 10, 12 years, my brothers and sisters come to Christ. But my, my, my dad and mom are somewhat restored in relationship because my dad needed help in the restaurant business. My, but when I would share with my dad, I'll never change. I'm Muslim. I'll never deny my faith. I'm Muslim. And, you know, you pray for 15, 21, 23 years. And your dad's, my dad, heart attack and bypass surgery and diabetes and kidney failure and dialysis and amputation and on his death. But I'll never change. I'm Muslim. I'll never deny my faith. I'm Muslim. You know, I'm not going to share all that story, but it's interesting. After 70 years of Islam, both my mom and dad, God opened their eyes and both of them made Jesus the Lord of their lives after 70 years. And that's where my dad, my dad was not supposed to live, went back, built that complex, became the first underground. My dad's now in heaven. Uh, My mom's 88, I think, maybe nine. Anyway, her birthday's come. And she's the wildest preaching machine for Jesus on the planet. But I don't think that high school girl thought that that simple invitation 
would actually impact so many. You know, it's interesting. My, my dad and mom went through qu quite a journey before they received Christ. But there was young, young, one young man that probably had the greatest impact on their lives. His name was Kevin Kane. And he actually, a friend of mine, but he, he actually ended up going and living with my parents in Jerusalem. My dad was pretty sick, but he took care of my dad and just loved on my parents. And God, I believe, used him more than any individual for them coming to Christ. But what's really interesting, and think about this. This was in 99, 2000. It, was, it would have been late 1999. So... Basically, 2000 that my parents came to Christ. So watch this. 17 and a half, almost 18 years earlier. This young man. Was a freshman at Houston Baptist University. And in the first week of school, there was an FCA meeting and a, a friend of mine was speaking. But when they when the, when the FCA was over, there was a young man. And I said, I, I need to talk to you, sir. And I walked with him into the gym. And he says, I sat him there for a little over two hours. And that young man, Kevin Kane, his first week as a freshman at HBU, I had the privilege of leading him to the Lord. Eighteen years later, God uses that man to open my parents' eyes to the love of Christ and then receive Jesus Christ. Your life makes a difference. Your life really matters. Don't you ever dare about quitting or giving up. And you read through it. It's really interesting. Some of these people seem were depressed and lonely and hopeless. But as they just kept going and kept getting back up and kept touching and maybe sacrificing or giving somebody hope or just loving or, or, or feeding. You know, I, I, I think about the, 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 the young boy that had a, a small lunch that's fed over 5,000 people. But I thought the mom that probably prepared his lunch that morning. And she's thinking, I'm just being a mom. I got no, nothing great in life. I'm just trying to feed my family. I don't think she was thinking as she prepared that boy's lunch one day that that lunch would be used to preach the gospel today to millions. So listen, wherever you are, God knows right where you are. And God has chosen you right where you are to take you to change this world. So be faithful where you are. Love, serve, don't, don't listen to lies. Your life doesn't matter. Listen, God knows right where you are. I think David just taking care of sheep on the back of the desert thinking, oh, I'm just, and God says, no, you're to be king. And the Messiah will come through your loins. So your life really matters. And, and I jotted down, I, I like to get it in order before we pray. Um, well, I will tell you this. There's a man named Sam Martin. Anybody know who Sam Martin is? No, y'all never heard of Sam Martin. But Sam Martin led a man to Christ that became my mentor for over 20 years. Sam Martin led John Osteen to the Lord. And he was my mentor for over 20 years. Every time I speak, I hear John Osteen. Even several of the phrases I use in the gospel illustration. Jesus didn't come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people alive. John Osteen. But whoever heard of Sam Martin, but yet Sam Martin's life impacted a man, impacted a man that has impacted my life. And literally John Osteen impacted millions for the kingdom of God. Even your own pastor. And then I, I, I unfortunately I didn't write the name of this shoe salesman. It was in the mid 1800, 1854. But he, uh, he led a young man to the a young man to the Lord named D.L. Moody. You ever hear D.L. Moody? Uh, so uh, who, who was uh, the Sunday school teacher. Uh, D.L. Moody was working at the sh shoe store. And his, the Sunday school teacher went and led him to the Lord. But D.L. Moody, watch this. His life impacted F.B. Meyer, who impacted Wilbur Chapman, who impacted Billy Sunday. Had anybody here of Billy Sunday? One of the great evangelists in that era. Well, Billy Sunday impacted Mordecai Ham. And Mordecai Ham led a young teenager named Billy Graham to the Lord. And God knows how many Billy Grahams led to the Lord. But it started with the Sunday school teacher. 
So listen, your life really matters. Your life makes a difference. But the greatest life, we just read about at the beginning, that one solitary life, Jesus Christ. The way to really make a difference is to allow Jesus to make a difference in your own life. Regardless of where or how or what, what you believe or how you were born, you listen, God loves you so much and so believes in you. He sent Jesus. Watch this. Not just to restore you unto himself so that you spend eternity with him, but now you can receive him so that he through you can make a difference in this world. So I'm going to you, if you don't know Christ, this morning is a good, good morning to say, Jesus, I need you. For one, not only as he came and resurrected, but he's coming back. Amen. And when we come, when he comes back, we want to hear well done. He didn't say he didn't say perfect. He says, well done, that good and faithful. So wherever you are, keep getting back up. Keep loving, keep serving, keep letting his light shine through you and watch how God will use your life to touch others. And who knows? Maybe over two billion people. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, thank you. Lord, I, I thank you. How you, before we ever took our first breath, you formed and fashioned us in our mother's womb. Lord, you scheduled every day of our life. So nothing about our life surprises you. You know the good, the bad, and the ugly, and you still have a divine purpose and destiny for our lives. So, Father, I pray that you would breathe into us such hope that we will never give up and we will always get back up, knowing that you love us with a perfect love. Your love never fails. And, Lord, actually, your perfect love casts out all fear so that we can walk with you to touch and change this world. And, Lord, I thank you that each person here not only does their life matter, but how many of us have given up on someone else knowing that you haven't given up on them? A son, a grandchild. Lord, you still have a plan for their lives. So Lord, I, I pray for, first that each one here that we would know you, the author of life, the father of life, the creator of all, and Lord, you give us that opportunity through your son, Jesus. And if that's you, you can just say, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I believe God raised you from the dead. Jesus, I not only repent of all my sin, I need you now to come in and be the Lord of my life. And as you do that, and if you've done that, now you know God has a divine plan and purpose for your life. And that's to make a difference in this world. And, Lord, we can do that by walking with you. So, Lord, I pray that by the Spirit of God, you would put, it, put in us a hunger and a thirst to know you, to love you, and to follow you. And, Lord, as we do, knowing that you never give up on us, we can reach out, we can touch, we can bless, we can risk, we can sacrifice, we can give, knowing, Lord, not only that we can finish our race, but, Lord, as we look back, may we see that one or even two billion that used our, you used our life to make a difference. Lord, seal in our hearts that the plans you have for us are not only good and for a future, but it's for someone else. And Lord, may each one of us walk that out in such a way that through our lives, your kingdom come and your will be done, even as you ordained it in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray, and all of God's people said, amen. God bless you.